This sermon today isn't real heavy doctrine. This is more of an exhortation sermon to keep you focused on uh, the task that's before you because it's very, very easy to get out of focus down here on this earth and, and start to look around and see the sights that dazzle, you know, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life and, and things, you know, and the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches. They can sometimes spring up and choke the word and you can start becoming unfruitful. So I'm just trying to remind you today where your treasure should be. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Hmm. Did you know that there's going to come a day when the very richest people on earth are going to be Christians? There won't be any more Rothschilds or Rockefellers or... or uh, whoever, name the rich families, whatever. They won't be around. They'll be burning in hell under our feet, you know. And the rich people that are on the earth are going to be those that are ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ that served Him in this life. They gave up their riches in this life for the life to come, the world to come. Let me ask you a question. If the Lord came to you and He said, I'm going to give you a thousand dollars in cash, tax-free, you know, whatever. I'm going to give you a thousand dollars in cash for every soul you witness to. Would you be more zealous for the Lord? Yeah. See, I heard this statement before, and they said, "For every soul you win to Christ." But see, I don't agree with that because then people compromise the way that they win souls, you know, and they say, oh, "I've led three thousand to the Lord," you know, whatever. Uh huh. I bet you have, you know. But what you need to understand is, as a Christian, you can't really do wrong if you're doing it the Bible way now. You know, get that one. When you go out and you hand a tract to somebody, you can't fail at that. You see, either it's going to go to their salvation or to their condemnation. You can't go wrong. There's never been one Christian that's ever put out a tract that the Lord looks down and says, Oh boy, I sure wish they wouldn't have done that. You can't go wrong. You cannot fail in your ministry of reconciliation. If you're doing the Lord's work His way, now if you're going out and preaching a false gospel, then yeah, you're failing. But if you're going out and you're preaching it God's way, you can't do wrong. Because those people that are hearing the gospel or that, that are receiving the tract or whatever, those people, it's either going to go to their salvation or their condemnation. But it's not going to be like, you know, the Lord's going to get up there and say, I really wish you wouldn't have handed out that track that day. That really bothered me. <laughs> you know, unless you're Steven Anderson who teaches that tracting is wrong, you know. That guy's such a nut. I don't know how anybody can follow that that child. I get sick of it after a while, you know. I get all these comments on my channel, you know. You should listen to Steve Anderson. He knows what he's talking about. You're a false prophet. You know, blah, 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 whatever. What if a lost person doesn't want the truth? Let's look at that. John chapter 3. And that's going to be the majority of the people that you'll run into. You know, most people don't want the truth. And this passage right here is going to tell you why they don't want the truth. John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21 says here, and this is the condemnation that light is coming into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. As a Christian, you should never be afraid of the truth. You should never be afraid of light coming to you. And when you have a Christian that starts to say, I don't want the light, don't tell me what the Bible says. I don't care what the Bible says. you got a problem when that starts to happen. And what happens is that light that helps you to see, you know, right now I'm kind of standing here in the shade, you know, but over here in this area over there is the sunlight. You know, it's easier to see things over there than it is over here. You know, when you look down at me, it's not that dark, but... You know, the point is, when the sun's out, it's a lot easier to walk around. You know, there's a lot of rocks and things up here, a lot of, you know, thorns and thistles and things. 
it'd be real miserable to try to walk around up here in pitch black darkness. You say, unless you were doing evil, right? If I was up here trying to make a drug deal or something like that, then I'd want it to be dark. If I was up here trying to do some other kind of illegal activity, I'd want it to be dark. But I'm not up here doing anything illegal, so I want it to be light. And the, the brighter the light, the better, you know? See? But you see, most people hate this book not because it's unscientific or because it's, it's foolish or whatever. They hate this book because this book condemns them. That's why they reject this book. They don't like it. So you come to somebody, and it's interesting too because this whole easy believism thing tries to say that the lost world is just kind of walking around going, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. You know, I don't know if this is wrong or not. You know, and you say, believe in Jesus Christ. Oh, what do I have to do? Pray this prayer. Okay. And then they get saved and then they understand that they're sinners. That's nonsense. Absolute nonsense. The majority of the lost world rejects Jesus Christ because they know that Jesus Christ is the truth. And it means they're going to have to clean up their life. They're going to have to start living according to this book. And you say, well, then, you have, then you're saying that somebody gets saved and then they have to live a clean life after that. I didn't say that. But what I'm saying is, you know, I understand there are people that live a carnal life and are messed up. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. What I'm saying is the lost world rejects the light of this book. They reject the idea of absolute truth. Why? Because it condemns them. Truth is condemnation. Okay? It's just the way it is. Because you see, if you have absolute truth, then if you don't believe in absolute truth, then you're wrong. You say, well, no, I have, a, I have another opinion. No, you're wrong. Well, I have another way of looking at it. No, you're wrong. If you don't believe the truth, you believe a lie. That's the way it is. That's why the world is repulsed by the idea of absolute truth. They can't stand it. That's why the lost world is continually trying to whittle away at the absolute truth. You say, sodomy is an abomination. No, it's an alternative lifestyle. No, it's an abomination. No, it's a, sodomy is just a, um, some people are born that way. Uh, it's not their fault. Yes, it is. It's an abomination. See, they don't like that. They don't like those absolute dogmatic truths. But that's what the Bible says, and that's what you as a Christian are required to stand for. And we're going to see a little bit later what happens when you don't stand for absolute truth. You say, well, then I see that the lost people don't want truth because their deeds are reproved. So then what should we do when we're witnessing to them? Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, verse 11. Mark chapter 6, here's Jesus giving instructions to his disciples. Mark 6, 11 says, And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. He's sending out his disciples and saying, Witness to these lost people. Be my ministers of reconciliation, in other words. And if they don't receive you, you come to them and you keep pressing them, see? And you keep telling them and telling them and you force them and you get right in their face and you say, you, you have to accept the truth. I'm not going to leave here until you accept the truth. You better accept the truth. Is that what Jesus said? No. Hey, you stupid Christian. You stupid, narrow-minded, bigoted fundamentalist. Get out of here. Okay, you were warned. And you leave. You don't stay there and you don't say, well, maybe we could find some common ground. No. Bye-bye. You see, truth, if you remember, truth is acquainted or is, uh, is said to be like money. Okay? It's treasure from God. Now, if you say to some lost person, here, I see you're having some financial trouble. Here, take my money. And they take that thing and they, they grab it and they throw it. And say, get out of here. I don't want you here. I don't want that money of yours. What do you do? Do you go over and you pick up your wallet and you say, here, I, I really like that you to have. No. You take your money. You take the truth of God's word. And you put it in your pocket. And you say, see ya. 
and you walk away. That's what Jesus Christ did when he was here on the earth. He said about the Pharisees, he said, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. Now think about that. As God manifest in the flesh, could he have made them accept the truth? Did he not know how to reprogram their brain? Couldn't he have said, believe, and they would have believed instantly? They would have seen who he was? He could have done that, but you see, the Lord won't do us something like that because of free will. The Lord is not going to force anybody to accept the truth. Now, the time will come when they will, you know, when they stand before God, every knee is going to bow. I'm aware of that. But in this life, hey, you have to come to God by free will, an act of your own free will. God doesn't force people to be saved. But notice there it said, too, about Sodom and Gomorrah. It'll be more tolerable in that day for Sodom and Gomorrah than for that city. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? They were burned. Now, what happens to somebody that rejects the truth? They are burned in the fires of hell. See? So, somebody that rejects the truth, they're going to burn. You say, well, that was back in the Gospels, Brian. What, is, what about today? Is that still good for us today? Acts chapter 18. We'll see about this. See if any Christian ever practiced this. And I've been over a lot of this stuff before in other studies, but, you know, it's always good to constantly renew your mind. All right? There's a big old bug right there. Get out of there. He's in my lens there. <sighs> Sorry about that. Oh, the joys of preaching outdoors. <laughs> uh, Acts chapter 18, verses 5 through 6. See, we got to have a fun drive now and raise up millions of dollars so I can buy a big building someplace and call it a church. <laughs> yeah. Acts chapter 18, verse 5. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Okay, he's giving them the truth. He's committing the, or he's, he's there accomplishing the ministry of reconciliation. He's an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Verse 6. And when they opposed themselves... And blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from henceforth. I will go unto the Gentiles. Very interesting there. It says they opposed themselves. When somebody rejects the truth, when somebody takes that track that you've given them and they rip it up or they take it and they throw it in the dumpster, you know what they're doing? They're opposing themselves. They're only hurting themselves. It isn't, oh, I failed in my mission. I didn't lead them to the Lord. You know, I presented the gospel, but I wasn't able to successfully, you know, convert them. No. When you give them the tract and they throw it out, or you put a tract down someplace and you see somebody pick it up and throw it into the, into the dumpster, you know, when they do that, they're opposing themselves. And what do you do? Do you go over and grab them and say, you will accept the truth. I'm not leaving until you accept the truth. No. You just kind of say, hmm, okay. You know? Your blood be upon your own heads. I'm clean. I did my part. Bye-bye. That's what you do with a lost person that doesn't want the truth. What about if a saved Christian rejects the truth? And this happens all the time. Okay, I've met many Christians that there are certain aspects of truth that they will accept. Other ones they'll fight you on. Okay, You'll, you'll get somebody that, that is truly saved. They're King James Bible believing, but they watch television. And I'm just like, what are you doing? How can you watch TV? Why is there no conviction there? You know, let's look about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. See, you got to remember that Christians are saved sinners. They're not saved saints that never sin again and that live pure and holy lives that, that, uh, without ever messing up. There are a lot of Christians out there that, that are living in sin. That's a shame. But let's look here. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 4 through 13. And now this passage here is about this, this man who was basically committing fornication with his father's wife. 
Uh, I don't know if that was a stepmother or his actual birth mother or whatever, but the point is this was a very serious sin. Look at verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? You let somebody into your fellowship that's messing around with sin. And this guy, notice there, it says in verse 5, delivered him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. This was a saved man that was doing this. How wicked, how vile. But you see, they were tolerating it, maybe because he was given a lot of money or something, I don't know. But they were tolerating this sin, and Paul said, hey, that little leaven that's in your fellowship there, that's going to leaven the whole lump. It's going to mess everybody up. That's why if you're fellowshipping with other brethren and somebody's got a sin, you go to that brother and you say, you need to clean that thing up and you aren't going to come back here until you do. You don't just put up with sin. All right? You have to take care of that thing. And if they say, don't tell me about it, I'm not going to listen to you. Then you just say, okay, Lord, you saw what he did. And the Lord will say, yeah, I did. Hey, Satan, go ahead, get him. That's why you see a lot of Christians that resist the truth and their health is failing they're having financial problems. They're having spiritual problems. They're falling apart. Why? Because God delivered them to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now, can you get out of that if you're in that? If you're messed up as a Christian? Absolutely. You can repent. You can turn from that stuff. You can turn back to the Lord. But you're probably going to have some things that you're going to need to take care of there. Some things that aren't just going to be gone, boom, right away. You know, if you messed around and you got so messed up that your marriage ended in a divorce or something, and I know a lot of brethren that have that happen, you aren't going to just come, boom, snap right out of it, okay? There's going to be some hardship and some bad times that you're going to have to go through as a result of that sin that you did years earlier, all right? If you sow to the flesh, you will till the flesh reap corruption, all right? If you're smoking for years and years and years and years and years as a Christian, and you want to quit, there's a good chance that you're going to get cancer or emphysema, even if you do quit. You know, why? Well, you made a decision years ago. If you're watching a lot of television, you can't have a lot of television up here because it cleaves to your mind, you know, those wicked things that you're seeing. You can't expect to have television viewing every night and be able to memorize Scripture. So God's not going to be able to use you the way He would like to. See, whatever you do in this life as sin, no, you will not lose your salvation, but you will destroy your fellowship between you and the Lord. See, that's why it's good to stay, to try and cleanse yourself, to get under the light of God's Word, and let this light shine upon your life and say, okay, Lord, what do I need to clean up? That's very important. But continuing there, in verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. There you see that T word again. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. In other words, you're not going to be able to avoid those wicked types of sinners in the world. You're going to have to go to the market and buy things from them, go to the stores, you work with them, whatever. You know, you're going to be around the lost, sinful world. But look at this, verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Those lost people out there, God's judging them. But a saved person, you have to judge them. There is a big branch down. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. You're to judge saved people. And if you have saved people in your midst, in your fellowship, that are messing around with sin, and serious sin like this one here, you say, out you go. Sorry, brother, you can't come here and fellowship till you get that thing cleaned up, till you get away from that sin. 
Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30. It says here, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. You know why the, the reason most Christians don't really have much victory in their life? They're living like the world. You know, they're, they're messing around with sin. They're messing around with things of the flesh. They're not really given over certain parts of their life to the Lord. They hear truth and they resist the truth. And as a result, the Lord says, okay, I can't help you. You know, and yeah, you're saved. Yeah, you're on your way to heaven. Sure. But you're just going to have problems in life. That's why you see Christians that are having all kinds of financial troubles and all kinds of health issues. And I mean, I'm not saying every time you get sick, then you're in sin or something like that. I understand that. Okay, but when you see somebody that's just a perpetual life of failure, <laughs> um, something's not right there. And usually when you talk to them, you'll see that they'll have, you know, you say, man, contemporary Christian music is wicked. Well, some of it's okay. Hey, man, television, I won't have a television in my home. You'll see them, they'll be like, well, you know... <sighs> I, I kind of do. I mean, I watch it once in a while. Uh-huh. And on and on and on. I mean, you go down the list of sins, and you'll see Christians messing with them, and you'll see God messing with them as a result. It's a shame, really. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now here's the solution to this whole thing. What is your motivation behind your ministry? When you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ, what is your motivation? Well, you say duty. Sure, there's duty there. Absolutely. But, you know, when you have somebody that's just serving the Lord strictly out of duty, um, that's not even right either. Uh, there's duty, but there's also this aspect to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 1 here, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. If you're doing the work of the Lord out of kind of an arrogant, you know, I'm going to tell you the way it is kind of a spirit, that's not right. You see, when you go out and you put out tracks for the, the lost people to find, there should be a spirit of sorrow for these lost people. You should... Look at them and you should say, that person there, that man, he's going to hell. That woman there, she's going to hell. Man, that's sad. I don't want to see that person go to hell. And when you see a Christian and you see them messing around with some kind of a sin, some kind of a lust of the flesh, you should have charity. You should look at them and go, oh boy, I feel so bad for them. How sad. And you say, well, then you should compromise, right? No, you shouldn't compromise. You should just have charity in what you're doing. Continuing here, look at verse 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. That's one of the reasons I have a big problem with a lot of this soul winning stuff. You get these guys, especially like in the past, they're, they're bragging about we had so many souls saved, you know, and all this other stuff. Uh, it says there it's not puffed up, you know. Got to watch out for some of that. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. All right, that's a tough one. You know, because there are Christians that do things and you don't know what their mo motivations are and things. And, you know, the Bible talks about evil surmisings. It's very difficult not to think evil of people. Uh, because many times you start doing that and people will take advantage of you. Um, been there, done that, you know. But that's 
as a Christian, you're supposed to have charity. But now look at verse 6. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Absolute truth. You go out and you see something that the Lord is doing and some kind of thing that the Lord's working, and you rejoice in that thing. You rejoice in the fact that we have absolute truth. Verse 7. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. It's a good little thing to do every once in a while is just check your charity level. How much charity do you have? Why are you trying to serve Jesus Christ? Is it just out of arrogance or, or just trying to be nasty and trying to get people to argue with you? Or do you actually have charity? Are you actually concerned? You know, See, yes, we have absolute truth. And yes, we don't we're not supposed to compromise that absolute truth. But you see, we're supposed to be better than the other people. As ambassadors of Jesus Christ, ministers of the gospel, we're supposed to be higher up than other people. All right, we're supposed to do better when it comes to things of, of charity and, you know, giving truth to people. And, you know, sometimes you have to be arrogant with people. I'm not saying that you don't. I'm not saying that you always have to be this kind, little milk toast type of a person. There are some times that, a, that a, you have to answer a fool according to their folly. I understand all that stuff. You have to weigh that stuff out. You'll learn that as you grow as a Christian. You'll learn those situations. But your motivation should always be one of charity. That's very important to understand. Turn next to James chapter 3. Two more places to turn to today and then we're done. James chapter 3. James 3, verse 13. Okay, it says here, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in them, or sown in peace of them that make peace. So now wait a second, Brian. That passage is saying that truth is pure, it's peaceable, it's easy to be entreated. But every time I try to give truth to relatives, to family, to lost people, you know, it's not easy to be entreated. Why is that? Well, because many times their mind is closed to the truth. But when you have somebody, and you'll meet somebody like this, you know, somebody that's really truly looking for the truth, all those things there will come true. It is easy to be entreated. Why? They want to hear it. You know, they want to learn. They want to know what you have to say. And they might give you some questions, you know, uh, not out of, out of malice or anything, but they're just curious about certain things. You might have some of that. But the fact is, that truth, when their mind is open to it, okay, when Jesus sends out his disciples, he goes, go into the city. If they don't receive what you're saying, walk away. Get away from them. Shake off the dust of your feet. Go away. Bye-bye. Well, then what's the opposite of that? You go into the city, the people do receive you. And they're willing and eager to hear it. Willing and eager to hear the truth. That's when you give them the truth. Somebody gets arrogant and they get in your face and they say, don't talk to me about that stuff. As a Christian, brethren, you don't have to fight with them. Okay? You don't have to be there and, and fight and fight and fight and argue with these people. Just, okay. See ya. You know, maybe get in one little final jab or something. 
you know, well, the Bible says that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Bye-bye. You know, go away. You say, well, that's in the book of James. What about for a Christian here? You know, because I teach dispensationally that James is more for a tribulation saint or a, somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble. But uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. That's where we end today. Second Timothy chapter two verses twenty through twenty two through twenty six. Excuse me. It says here, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. Now look at this. Okay, the lost world. You come to them and you say you need to be saved. They say, says who? You know, I heard that the King James was a homosexual. And it has what to do with anything, you know. I heard that, uh, what, how would you answer this? Who did Cain marry? You know, how did Noah bring such and such onto the ark? Or how did this or how did that? How did Jesus walk on the water and we can't walk on the water today? Um, you know, they come up with all these stupid questions. Why? What are they trying to do? They're trying to get you to argue, see. They're trying to get you into strife. Look at verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Remember back there when Paul was speaking to the Jews, they opposed themselves? See? And what did Paul do? He walked away from them. When you get somebody who's lost, and they oppose themselves, walk away from them. You're not supposed to get into a, in this big heated argument with them, and strife and contention and everything else. But continuing here, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. You see it there? If you are a true servant of Jesus Christ, and you have your own life taken care of, you know, that's another thing. I, I got to just say this. I think one of the main problems with personal witnessing when you have problems and issues and things, a lot of times it's your own fault. It's things that you haven't cleaned up in your own life. So it's kind of like the Lord's going, okay, you're one of my ministers of reconciliation, but if that person gets to know you, they get saved and they get to know you, they're going to see the hypocrisy in your life. So why should I bring that person to salvation, you know, through you, through your witness, and then they get saved and they come into your life and they see that you have TV and they see that you do this and you do this and you do that, you know? See, that's a problem. If you want to really be used of the Lord, you have to clean up your life first. Then the Lord will use you. But if you're just messing around with sin, a lot of times you're not going to have much power in witnessing. If you want true power in witnessing, you've got to get things cleaned up in your own life. You know, And when you get to that point, then you'll see that oftentimes, yeah, people are still, there's still going to be people trying to fight you and things like that, but you avoid those questions and you say, are you a sinner? What do you have to do to be saved? If you die tonight, do you know for sure where you would go? See? And if you run into a Christian that's messing around in sin and you try to warn them and they don't want to hear it, do the same thing. Walk away from them. Don't sit there and argue with them and, and fight them over it and stuff. If you see that there's an unyielding spirit there, bye-bye. See ya. Hey, there are 7 billion people on this earth right now. Don't you think you can find other people to witness to? Well, brother, I just I got this guy and I'm just going to keep fighting with him all the time. And that'll prove what? You know? Yes, we have absolute truth. But if people don't want to accept that absolute truth, it's their problem. If you've witnessed to people and you try to talk to people and they say, get out of my face, okay, I'll go to somebody else. See, you don't have much time in this life. It'd be kind of like saying, uh, i got to build a, a shelter right now because there's a rainstorm coming in a week from now. And so i got to get this shelter built. So I get this piece of wood, this log, this tree, I cut it down and whatever, and I start trying to work with this wood, and it's awful and it's terrible, and I, I can't, it just doesn't want to yield itself to being building material. Should I keep fighting with the log? Or should I toss it off to the side and go to another one? 
See? That's the point of trying to that I'm trying to illustrate with this sermon. There are some people, you just can't get through to them. You say, well, then I give up on them totally. No, I didn't say that either. You can pray for people, and you can try to get in a little jab once in a while if there's somebody that's in your life. You know, I think we all have lost relatives and things, but, uh, you know, that you're going to run into. You can try to get in a little jab here and there. But if they don't want to listen to you, brethren, time is short on this earth. You don't have to convert everybody out there and end up in strife. Um, the knowledge that's from above is, is pure. It's peaceable. Easy to be entreated. Why? Because God, you know, when somebody really wants God, they'll be willing to listen. They'll be willing to listen to the truth. They're coming to the light. But when people are running away from the light, it's kind of like a thief, you know, doesn't want to find a policeman. Why? Because he doesn't want his deeds being reproved. And a lot of sinners don't want to find God because they don't want their deeds being reproved either. And so, does absolute truth exist? Right there. Not right here, by the way. Right here. That's why I point people to this book. Not to me. I mess up things and, you know, I, I come back and I go, oh, I can't believe I taught that thing years ago or, or whatever. I'm still learning. I'm learning all the time. And I'm willing to say, you know, hey, I was wrong for this or I was wrong for that. But the fact is, this book doesn't mess up. Okay? This book is absolute truth. And we, as Christians, are ministers of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And we have absolute truth. We should never compromise the absolute truth that we have. And if somebody doesn't want to accept that absolute truth, and they make it clear, I don't want it, just don't even talk to me about it, okay, bye-bye. And you meet some Christian, they're messing around in sin, they don't want to hear about it, see ya, goodbye. You see, absolute truth... And the things that the Lord has given us, those are the things that we're going to be rewarded for, you know, in eternity. We're going to be rewarded for what we've done with that absolute truth. You know, I mean, it's the fact that it's worth something great, that's what we're going to be rewarded for. So why waste time down here on earth messing around with people that don't want it? So, just wanted to put that sermon together. Um, because I see a lot of brethren, you know, that's that's another thing, another reason I I don't, you know, just have all comments approved, because a lot of times I see sh this strife thing, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and I just think to myself, don't you guys have anything better to do? You know, I mean, I I mean I've seen some of my videos that that have the comments are all approved automatically. I've seen you know arguments between a Bible believer and some new versionist or something and these arguments will go on for two or three months at a time and they're putting up five comments you know and then and, and this guy puts up three and then that guy puts up five and, it, and it's just like what do these people do for a living i mean what do they just like get on youtube and argue or something i mean we don't have much time don't waste your time on people like that okay we do have absolute truth don't let anybody talk you out of that too by the way so uh, let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just uh, I pray that uh, all those out there would seek to really clean up their lives so they can be used of you. I pray, Lord, that if there's uh, some Christian out there right now that's, that's really truly saved, they know they're saved, um, they, they're definitely born again, but they're having problems with some kind of a sin, some kind of thing in their life, Lord, that you've convicted about them about and they know they need to get rid of it. They know it's not right. They know it's, it's keeping them from that right relationship with you. I pray, Lord, that they would get that thing under control, that they'd confess it and forsake it and move forward, and that they wouldn't mess around with that sin and, and play around with that thing any longer, but that they would seek to clean up their lives so that they can be used by you in a mighty way. And Lord, if there's anybody that's lost out there and they're not wanting to come to you for salvation because of the, the pride of life, Lord, that they don't want to drop their self-righteousness, I pray, Lord, that you would cut through that thing and that um, you would just help them to, to know that they need to get saved and that there's nothing on this earth that is worth them going to hell. 
And so, Lord, I just uh, pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, that's going to be it. Um, still working on the second part of the Independent Fundamental Baptist Catholicism messages. If you haven't seen that yet, the first part there, the three parts of it, um, I suggest you watch it. Um, there's a lot of very important things in that. I know some of the brethren are very stuck on their traditions and practices, and they don't like to be challenged in certain areas. Um, but you, you really need to look at it, okay? And you need to consider some of the things that are said in that thing there, and you need to ask the Lord what He would have you to do, all right? Um, I personally have struggled with traditions for many, many years. Uh, I was raised in church buildings, and I never questioned things. Um, I'd hear something negative, and I'd just kind of just cover it up. Um, but when I really got right with the Lord, and and, uh, and by the way, most of my life I've been very, very wicked. Okay, Don't look at me and think, oh, you know, Pastor Brian there, he's, he's really been just a saint all of his life. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, that's not true. Uh, far from it. I've, I've only really gotten right with the Lord um, for just a few years, really. Uh, I've been a professing Christian since the time I was a boy, but uh, my actions did not match that profession for most of my life. And it was only recently that I really came you know, back to be with the Lord and uh, I'll talk about that. I'm going to do my testimony coming up here in the future. I had originally recorded it for sermon audio, but I'm actually going to record it again because there's some new details uh, that have come into my life, one of which is sitting over there. Um, but uh, so we have some new things coming up here in the future. Um, I'm going to be coming out with the second part of the Independent Fundamental Baptist Catholicism study. Uh, and then just a lot of things coming up here, uh, some new ideas, new projects and things. So uh, just a quick update on the land thing. Um, we're trying to finish up some of these more important studies and then we're going to be, um, we're going to be buying uh, some land and we're going to build as we have the money. And so that's where we're at right now. Um, we're going to try to do this thing without going into debt. Uh, it's a lot more difficult that way, but this is the way we prayed about it, the way we've planned it. We said, you know, probably, I know a lot of people are probably thinking, what's taking you so long getting a house? Well, uh, we could go out and we could get one tomorrow if we went the way of debt. But uh, we want to uh, try to avoid that whole debt issue. And I'm going to be talking about that in the future in another sermon. But uh, we want to avoid the thing of debt, and we are both willing to sacrifice a lot of comfort um, for the thing of living a debt-free life. And uh, like I said, I'm going to talk about that more in the future. But um, our plan was late summer, early fall, that we would get a property and then start working. Uh, from there, working to move things to there and setting up the ministry on a, more, on a permanent basis. And I realize there's really no such thing as a permanent thing here on this earth. Um, there's a million things that could happen. I mean, you could have a forest fire come through, burn the whole area out, and we'd have to move, or, or uh, have some nation, you know, invade America, and we'd have to run, or I don't know. You know, there could be an earthquake, and the whole property would fall down in, or something like that. <laughs> you never know. Um, but that's what our plans are for right now. So we will definitely keep everybody posted. Um, appreciate everybody's prayers. And, uh, okay, one more thing real quick. Um, just want to have uh, just a special prayer request to go out. Um, I really appreciated everybody praying for the uh, young former Catholic sister that got saved and her mother that got saved. And uh, I just want to just have everybody just pray for uh, my in-laws, my wife's parents. Um, they're not saved. And we have a burden for them to be saved. We've been praying every single day since we've been married for them multiple times a day. And um, so if, if you could just think about it this week, uh, just please uh, take them before the throne. Um, just my in-laws, the Lord knows who they are. He knows their names. So if you could please just pray for them to be saved, uh, we would greatly appreciate that. So that's it. Thank you.